This is Twit. There's a lot of people out there, uh, network professionals, who are still confused by multicast. Um, and Chibert, I, I remember you were telling me once about a story from uh, Interop Atlanta, back when we still had Interop Atlanta, where we maxed out a couple of our uh, our two OC3s with traffic uh, during the 9-11 uh, events. Can, can you tell me a little bit about that? Because I know that the solution was multicast. Yeah, actually, it, um, we were doing, a, actually, Carl and I uh, were doing a <laughs> demonstration. And uh, so 9-11 hit, everybody was all shocked. It was a horrible event, but they're all grabbing CNN. And we had two OC3s, which in those days was very sexy, and maxed them out, absolutely redlined. So the Interop team went around and started distributing out um, multicast video clients so with you know bookmarks in there so people could get to CNN but not use Unicast. So we went from maxing out two OC3s, so 255 megabit per second links, and we got it down, I believe, under 30 meg. And I think to this date, this is probably the most effective demonstration of just how much more efficient multicast is than unicast, especially for video. It's a technology that really ought to come back. I hear that various edge providers are doing it for local distribution. But for big style distribution, we, we really ought to revisit it or make a hybrid where we're doing unicast to uh, per ISP uh, multicast points and multicast out at the edges. We have a long way to go in video. I'm, I was doing lots of advanced video stuff at Cisco when I, when I left. Uh, I was working at dynamic product placement so that we could insert different products, like the old movie Repo Man where you had the, the cans that sort of generic. I was going to replace those with cans tailored for the, whoever was watching. That's actually pretty easy. I then wanted to move into more face replacement so I could replace people's faces and bodies and voices, and I figured and this Cisco didn't like hearing this part, but I figured the best customer for that was the porn industry. I also wanted to move more into interactive videos so that uh, I'm really interested in live theater and breaking that fourth wall between the, the actors and the, perform and the audience. Well, with a box like the Kinetics box, which is watching you, there is now a means so that uh, if you're in the performance space, I'm an audience member watching a show. If something happens in that show and I react to it in some way, say it's a, a scary movie and something happens and I go, huh! Um, in a real live theater, an actor on the stage would turn into the space and look at you. That would bring you directly into the video. It would make you, or the play, brings you into the play, makes you part of it. You become emotionally bound to it. It doesn't exist in television today, but with even simple little tweaks like pauses or focusing a person's eye into the audience space, you could completely change the uh, emotional feel of television shows. I know that companies like Pixar and like are interested in this sort of thing because part of it is, is not using this kind of technology to, to overusing it. If you look at 1970s movies, they just invented new zoom lenses and every movie used zoom lenses and it becomes really annoying. We have to avoid that. We have to develop new movie kind of techniques to use these techniques carefully. But ultimately, I believe that when we start making videos and movies, we're going to have to create a soundtrack, an audio track, but also a metadata track, which is going to be tracking every object in that video so that dynamically I can replace that object very efficiently in a set-top box because I have already the metadata about its shape and color and whatever so that I can rework the video on a per user basis based on not only who the user is, but what that user is doing at that instant and how, how they're expressing themselves uh, interacting with that, that video they're seeing. So there's a long way we can go on this.